basically, I was starting to uh, review and chronologize my father's military background. He, like a lot of World War II veterans, went overseas, served in the war, came home, and never talked much about the war. So I knew very little about his accomplishments nor his crew's accomplishments until after he passed away in 2003, at which time some of the early original crew members began to share with me some of the excitement that occurred in the skies over Germany and occupied Europe. So I began to research my dad's missions and their missions. I was very interested in finding out more about it. And I remember as a youngster, my parents had saved all their correspondence from the war years. And they were tucked away in my sister's attic. So I retrieved them and read every single one of them, thinking it would add to my story. But what I discovered was he couldn't write about missions. That would have been a security breach. But he wrote about life in general in the military. For example, I could track where he trained and how long he trained. And then my mom would write about events occurring back home during the war. But the most compelling thing in the letters I found was something I wasn't even looking for at the outset. This beautiful love story just poured off the pages. Here I had set out to write a war story, which I accomplished, but this love story grabbed me in such a way I couldn't ignore it. Vince, gee, I miss you, honey. Please try to come home soon, won't you? If I don't see you pretty soon, I don't know what I'm going to do. There are a lot of times when I think I'll go crazy, but then I get your letters out and start to read them all over again. The story of my parents and how they've met and fell in love is centered around employment at the old Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Company uh, in Baltimore. She was an operator during the war and he was a frame hop right out of high school. And um, legend has it they met in an elevator and always say the rest is history. Now they had their first date in March of 42. He proposed by April of 42 and they would have been married that summer. But an aunt who raised him would not give a 19-year-old permission to marry. At that time, you apparently needed written permission. So at that time, it was either enlist or be drafted. So he enlisted in the Army Air Corps, the forerunner to our modern-day Air Force, in June of 42, but wasn't called to duty until November of 42. So they were engaged at that time, and he went off to basic training in Nashville as a young uh, cadet, and they were still engaged. Some seven months later, approximately, he's gone on to Santa Ana, California, and back to Pecos, Texas area. My, mo my mom followed him out to Texas, where they were married a week later. They said their goodbyes in Kearney, Nebraska. And um, he was shipped overseas after a staging area in New England. Ultimately, uh, he and his crew went to, to uh, Ireland to deliver their new aircraft, and then on to England. My dad would write a letter from abroad, or my mom would send one to England, and sometimes it would take five weeks to arrive. Uh, for example, when I was born in May of 44, just two months after he departed or was deployed, he didn't know that I was born for like roughly 12, 14 days. And then he didn't know the details of the birth for another almost three weeks since uh, uh, following my birth. That's different from today where you, you have emails, and uh, cell phones and international calling is so easy. Skype, where servicemen deployed can keep connected to the family. This was a bit different time. Another illustration is his first Thanksgiving away. He was out in um, California, I believe, and my dad stood five hours in a line waiting to call home on a payphone. Now, can you imagine waiting five hours for your turn? And then you call home, there's no answer machine. There's no guarantee that your fiance at that time will be home. No so the five hours you've invested in calling home might have been for naught if nobody answered the phone. How m much different is that today when uh, you simply dial a cell phone and leave a voice message or you text a message? It was a, it was a very different time. And I've talked to so many people as I go around a book tour who have the letters from their husband or the boyfriend to the wife or girlfriend, but they don't have the return from the girlfriend or wife to the spouse, etc. And keep in mind that if a guy's running around Europe in foxhole to foxhole, he, has no, he doesn't have the wherewithal to carry a satchel of letters. 
My dad, being in the Air Corps, had a different situation. He stayed in a Quonson hut, for the most part, overseas, and a barracks here, and he could save the letters. And to his credit, he saved every one and brought them all back. So I have the complete story of the letters from my mom to him and his responses to her and vice versa. She walked guard duty with my dad once. He was in the, on the inside of the fence and she was on the outside of the fence. But these are the little snippets that appear in the uh, letters. Um, and I can tell you, having read 1100, it took me six months. Every night was a new surprise, a new little twist. We were just given a talk by a captain who has just come back from active service, and he has seen plenty. I want to pass on some of the things he told us. Through him, my outlook on this war has really changed. Hun, after listening to him, we are far from winning this war. I hate to say that, but facts are facts. The American people don't realize what our soldiers are up against and what our boys are going through. They enjoyed sharing uh, with one another the movies of the day and which ones they enjoyed like Bing Crosby, Gone My Way. My mom would say, make sure you see that, Vince. And, and he, he would write back, oh, it was great. And then he'd recommend some to hers. He also met some interesting people along the way. While I was out in Santa Ana, he met Mickey Rooney, and stood and talked to him at a bar for 15 minutes until his wife came over and, and pulled him away from the bar. That is Mickey Rooney. So that was an interesting time for my dad. He heard the Andrews sisters sing live. He heard Glenn Miller uh, play at a USO function at his base in August of 44, the very week that Glenn Miller was promoted from captain to major. Uh, but we're tragically four months later, Glenn Miller's plane went missing, presumably over the English Channel, never to be found. Um, he also got to see Joe DiMaggio, who was head of recreation and, and training at one of the bases my dad was at. So there were, the letters are filled with little tidbits of life back in the 40s. Um, my mom would write about putting the wash out in the backyard and how it would rain. Well, they didn't have a dryer. The, the wash would stay out on the line because it, it was gonna get wet anyway, so it'd have to dry all over again. Again, these are the kind of interesting things that take the reader back to a different era in our nation's history. I saw how much they were deeply in love and how much they wanted a family. Uh, my mom predicted they'd have five children, and sure enough, they had five children. She wrote on one letter, for example, it's in the book, her prediction of three, three boys and two girls. Well, she had the total right, but she had them in reverse order. We, she, they went on to have two boys and three girls. Um, they, uh, they were very prayerful. Uh, they made two promises at Kearney, Nebraska, and at B&O Station when he first went in, to write often and pray often. And they certainly wrote often, because, and that's proven by the volume of letters. And when you read their letters cover to cover, which I have the opportunity to do, you see how much faith they had in the good Lord, praying to him that my dad and his crew would make it back safely. And with so much tragedy occurring in the skies over Germany and Europe, on that campaign, it's evident that the prayers brought him back safely because while there were some injuries along the way, every one of those original crew members made it back to the States. Well, after having read the letters, I think I became more humble and, and certainly more appreciative of the sacrifices that that generation made in World War II um, and that sacrifices are made every day. Because when a young man or woman in uniform is deployed, they don't have a say as to where they go. They don't necessarily know the political agenda or why they're there, but they go and they defend our country and they, they obey and honor uh, and serve with great distinction. So it gave me that greater appreciation. Keep in mind, I was born May 26, 44. This is on my six month birthday. And my dad writes, my dearest little giz, which was a nickname all the Gizrils had. Happy birthday, son. Sorry I can't be there in person. You're too little to understand now, but they tell me there's a war on and I have to be here and you there. It won't be long though. You, mommy, and I will be together again. Mommy tells me you're growing into a big boy and can do just about any, everything but walk and talk. It won't be long before you'll be doing both of them. 
I hope you wait until I'm around before you do either, but things like that can't wait. They just happen. Take real good care of mommy for me and tell her I love her. Again, happy birthday. I love you dearly. Your devoted daddy. I don't know if I saw that letter when I was a youngster, a toddler, or heard about it, or read it even as a young boy. But to find that some 60 plus years later, open it up and see how devoted your dad was to you and wanting to be there. It was really quite an emotional thing for me.